Hi, welcome to the first of the modules of the, our Deep Learning for Artificial Intelligence course. This first module will cover the basics of machine learning. So let's get into that. This session will give you the basic ideas behind machine learning, and it's addressed for those people who have never worked with machine learning before. There are many of the slides that come from Kevin McInnes from Dublin City University, so I, sh I wanna acknowledge him for his work. Probably if you are in this course, you have heard about machine learning uh, somehow, and it seems that it's taking a lot of attention lately in the technology field. The first basic idea that I would like you to share with you is what's the main difference between uh, programming computers with machine learning compared to classical programming. Maybe you are more familiar to classical programming in which uh, the engineer, the programmer, will write some rules based on his knowledge, experience, and beliefs, right? That will process some data so that we get uh, solutions, answers for for whatever problem you are trying to solve. In the other hand, if you applied a machine learning approach, the paradigm is different. Now, what we will need basically is data or data, and also which answers we'd like to have with this data. So for example, if I have images and I want to know if this image belongs to a dog or a cat, what I would need to have are images as well as labels. So the answers, the data will be the images and the answer will be a label of cat and dog for just the images we, we're having. When we feed that into a machine learning system, at the output, it will somehow uh, learn, estimate some rules that will allow to predict new answers for new data points. So it's not, it's not it's writing rules, it's not in general that it's going to write uh, uh, code as in C or, or Python or whatever, but it will uh, self-program the algorithm so that it will solve the task that we want to address. Machine learning has been traditionally or was traditionally addressed in the following way. First of all, given some images or some, sorry, some input data, will the engineer, the scientist would design some algorithms, some rules actually to extract features so the features would, are the input data that later we will use to solve the problem. So it's kind of an abstraction of what we think is in, interesting and important from the raw data. So you can think it's like a pre-processing before uh, taking solving the problem. Imagine that we want to solve this problem of classifying between cats and dogs, and somehow we are able to write some code that we given an image will somehow estimate uh, the weight and the age of the animal. After that, the classic machine learning paradigm, given this synthesized version of this in input image, so now instead of having all these uh, dozens of pixels and RGB values, now we only have two, right? Weight and age. And uh, all the decisions will be based on these two values. So we have a two-dimensional vector. We feed that into a classifier. And this classifier is what we are going in machine learning to train, right? And we expect that this classifier will self-program. It will do like this task here of machine learning. So that data will be now, will be the features. And the answer will be whether we it's a cat or dog on a training data set. So the machine learning part will basically come here. So the output, uh, typically these classifiers what they predict is a probability for the two classes that we are trying to consider. In this case, if it's cat or dog, you get uh, a probability out of one of this image of this animal uh, belonging to the cat class or belonging to the, to the dog class. And finally, typically, if it's a classification problem, what we will want is to decide uh, which of the two classes uh, correspond. So typically, we are going to take the, the class with the highest probability, which will be or label cat. So this uh, pipeline, which will have a representation, a feature, 
and then later a learning paradigm it's what classic machine learning has been doing for ages however let's consider a specific setup of a classifier there's a type of classifier called neural networks which is going to be the core of this course so neural networks um, they are interesting because they have the potential to actually uh, not only uh, cover the output these properties but also to learn features so neural networks uh, by stacking layers of neurons something we'll cover in in the future what you could do now is um, remove the part in which the feature extraction is hand engineered and we what we do is we just directly inject into the neural network our data and we let our network to learn not only the final classification stage but also which are the features that are interesting is it the weight is it the the height is it the age is it the color of the fur whatever so neural networks especially when, when you start stacking many layers of them uh, they have this potential of learning the right representation the right features to solve the task in this case in this example the task is classification between cats and dogs so this end-to-end -end paradigm is the main uh, game changer between classical machine learning and deep learning which is the core of this course actually there are different ways of learning uh, living living totally apart uh, if we are using deep neural networks or another uh, machine learning tool there's this famous slide by Jan Lekun, one of the fathers of deep learning in which he kind of explains how uh, which types of machine learning can be addressed and which of them have more or less potential it covers three parts it talks about reinforcement learning supervised learning and unsupervised and predictive learning basically he argues the following let's read his quote here like most of human and animal learning is unsupervised learning if intelligence was a cake unsupervised learning will be the cake supervised learning will be the icing on the cake and reinforcement learning will be the cherry on the cake so this quote basically what it's telling us is that if we are going to develop intelligent systems they will be basically um, based on something called unsupervised learning for which we have huge amounts of data so we have most of the cake it's for unsupervised learning so most of the knowledge to learn from is unsupervised on the other hand actually in this course we will basically uh, tackle the supervised learning approach which maybe we don't have so much data to learn from a supervised learning but it's um, I guess it's a better way to start understanding how machine learning works because it's the most straightforward uh, um, setup paradigm to learn from there's a third work is reinforcement learning uh, which actually uh, it's for so it's hard to learn with reinforcement learning. There's not, not much, um, much information, not much data that allow to train reinforcement learning. And that makes it uh, extremely challenging to train from. In this work now, let's focus on supervised learning. There's a similar uh, approach to explain which are the different types of learning that we have, which was proposed from Alex Grave, in which he introduces the idea of whether the agent, the artificial intelligent agent, is passive or active. In the sense that an active agent will be able to interact with the environment and, let's say, be proactive when collecting the data it learned from. In any case, the passive agent, that's where we are, uh, will be focusing, will be an agent that just looking at data that's provided by some somebody else somebody else is collecting data and it's giving to the agent and this agent learns but the agent doesn't interact uh, with any environment so let's focus on as i mentioned supervised learning supervised learning um, you can think about it as uh, the most classic way of of uh, fitting a function f into uh, uh, given some input data so in this case what we have as x will be our input data i would like to uh, learn a function that will make a, a good uh, fitting so that the y is the, well, the the question the task that we want to solve so in this example 
uh, what do we mean? It means that we have like these points that you see over here. This will be our training samples. And by looking at training samples, we are going to estimate some parameters of a function f that will actually cover all the blank spots that we see that are uh, between the points. The nice thing here is like we have our training data. These are the points, our pairs of x and y's, right? So first we have our training data, pairs of x and y's. We, we can plot them. And the good thing is that now, if at test time, once, once we have fit our function, if we get a new x of, of, or in one of the positions where we never collected data, we'll be able to predict the y. So that's an, the nice thing of, of learning the functions. Because now, for if we manage to uh, fit this function for any x, we'll be able to predict the y value, the result. But in the end, uh, supervised learning, uh, actually, uh, most of the learnings, but let's make it easy now. Uh, you can think about it as uh, fitting a function in which we have a training data set of pairs of x and y's. What could these what could these pairs of x and y's be? So they could be, for example, as I was mentioning, the x could be images. Maybe now it looks challenging to understand how uh, these images can be encoded, how they can be represented, but um, that will come later, basically, as, as I mentioned earlier, the deep neural networks will learn how to represent, how to extract the features from the images. So if we want to solve a supervised learning task for image classification, so here you have examples from a very well-known data set called ImageNet, which you have images, X, and also labels, Y. So my container sheet, motor scooter, Leopard. So these are predefined classes in this case of image center were 1,000, and you have for each image one label. So we have a training data set, which is pretty big, like more than 1 million labeled images, which you have image and label. What we would like to do with this training data? If we do a good work at the supervised learning part, um, we'll be able to fit a function f that will not only uh, work well for the training data, because that's something that we already know. But what is important here is that generalizes well to unseen samples. It means that when it sees an image that you have never seen at training time, the algorithm will predict the right label. We'll be able to predict uh, which object appears in that image. That's one of the most challenging uh, features that we that to achieve with uh, machine learning, but you must be very aware of that. This is why, in order to, let's say, program or train our machine learning algorithms, we are going to take our data, our labeled data, and split typically in two uh, parts. One part for training in, that we will use to estimate to, uh, the parameters of our model. Another part of test. The part of data which is labeled that we use for test we're going to use it to assess, to evaluate how well our system is, is working. So we take our training data, we let our model to learn from it. And after that, we take our test data, we fit the X only, so let's say the image only on it, and look at the output and see which is the, the, the Y that it's predicted in this case. And as we, this data set, it's labeled, as we know the, the right, the correct Y for the test, we are able to evaluate how well our algorithm is doing. So this, this way, um, thanks to the test data, we can uh, have an intuition, have an estimation of if our algorithm is learning well or not. Here you see a more detailed uh, black box abstraction of how supervised learning works. And this is what you're going to be doing most of this course. So our goal is to train a model, a machine learning model that learns from data. In order to learn from data, we're going to collect training data. It means we're going to collect, uh, typically, if it's a deep neural network, a large amount of pairs of X and Y, so data, label, data, label. And we will run some learning algorithm, which is typically it's called you can name it as fit. That's uh, that's a, a common term at, of the at the software frameworks you'll be using. During this training phase, it's something that typically you only do once, right? You do it offline in advance. 
you estimate the parameters of, of your model. At test time, so I mean like when the, the model is at production, at inference or, or prediction, so we use uh, these terms in, 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 any, in any way, so we use one term or another. What we're going to do is we're going to fit and send data into the model. The model now will be working as to predict. So given our input data X, the model will predict Y with a hat. So these are going to be the predictions of our model. We would like that these Y with a hat predictions, they are correct. The next concept I want to uh, present here, it's what's the difference between regression and classification tasks. It's uh, these machine learning tasks, they are, they are very similar, but they depend on what's the type of target Y. So if target Y is continuous, then we'll be addressing a task of what we call regression. If the target Y is discrete, which will be a class, um, then we call this problem classification. For example, if we have a, a model, machine learning model that's going to predict the temperature for tomorrow, maybe the weather forecast, that's going to be a regression model. On the other hand, if we have like this model that looking at images, it predicts animals. So it can be one animal or another. It cannot be half dog, half cat. It's one or another. Then we are going to address a classification problem. Let's de develop a bit more on these two concepts. Let's start focusing on the regression task in which y, the output, is a continuous variable. What you see here is the most simple setup probably you can think about for machine learning. You have on the x-axis, you have an input variable of one dimension, so I can uh, draw it, plot it on a single axis. And um, on the vertical axis, y, we have the output variable, the target. In green, what you see here are the pairs of training data. So this will be data that we collect uh, from the problem that we want to, to solve. As you see here, we are just going to predict uh, the output value y, even one single scalar value x. If we choose to solve this problem with what we call a linear regressor, which basically means like fitting a line to this distribution of points, then the solution to a problem could be the, the line that I'm plotting here, an f of x. So that means fitting a function. For Now for any new x value that arrives, we'll be able to predict always the, the y value. Yeah, that's the most simpler uh, way of uh, solving a machine learning problem or the, the most simple setup and it's very easy to understand what's going on. But it will not be the case that always the input is 1D and the output has 1D dimensions. Things in general will be will have much higher dimension and will not be so easy to, to see what's going on. In the case of linear regression, when we say that we are training a model, it means that if it's a, it's a, a line, we will be estimating the slope and the bias, right? W and B. This means training uh, a model and there are like different solutions for, for that. Let's make it a bit more complicated now. Let's imagine now that the input is not one dimensional only, but it's um, n dimensional, so any dimensions. The input data has any dimensions. Now I cannot draw it. I can only plot two uh, graphs on the, on the screen. But I, I think you can get the, the idea. If we're still working with a linear regression, um, the, the formulation will still be the, the, the same. Right now, we'll have x will not be only one single value. It's going to be a vector in this specific example of, of m. And for each uh, of the values x, we're going to have a parameter, w, a weight, right? That will be multiplying each of the components of the x vector. So the w1, 2, 3, until m. And in addition, there's this bias term. For example, imagine that you would like to predict the price of a, ho of a house based on the squares meters, the location encoded with the latitude and the longitude, and the longitude. One way to do that would be like estimating this w's and b. And for any uh, combination of square meters and location, you'll be able to have predictions all on, the, on the price. Of course, the, the challenging part is predicting these double W's and MB's. 
Let's move to the other problem, the classification problem. Remember that in this case, the output is discrete. So now imagine that we want to predict between cats and dogs, right? And somehow we have a distribution of, of points that really by looking at the weight and the height, it looks good. It seems that this problem seems uh, kind of easy and feasible to solve with a linear classifier, which is again, now it's this curve, but notice now that what we are plotting here in the this X and Y's coordinates of the plot, actually it's a 2D dimensions of the input. Yeah, so the input now in this case, uh, the feature structure will be like the weight and the height. These are the two dimensions of X and Y. So the Y, the output variable of the class could be class zero plus one, that's a way to encode it. It's color coded in the, in the example, but maybe you can think that it's a, another axis that that it's uh, that gets out of the screen, right? Uh, maybe a, a Z outside of, of the screen, if you wanna think of running, but of course here I'm using a color code. Um, so fitting a linear align to classify classes, uh, it's, in this toy example, it's very visual, but in general, it will not be a good option in many of the cases. So there's a full field of machine learning with huge amount of solutions that uh, can tackle this problem. So here you have an example or three examples actually, in which we have like some input data for binary classification in red and blue. So there are, each row corresponds to three different examples. So you can look at them totally separately. And you have uh, in each column uh, the, the solutions that different machine learning algorithms, there's one called nearest neighbor, neighbors, linear SBM, RBF, SBM, Gaussian processes, decision trees, random forest, neural net. So there are like a, a huge range of catalog of tools, machine learning tools that estimate their own parameters only with the uh, training data. And based on the parameters that, that you estimate, you can classify, you can, in this case, uh, estimate which regions would correspond to the red or blue classes. Yeah, and as you see, like depending on the machine learning algorithm, you're going to have different outputs. And typically there's a trade-off between computation and, and accuracy on, on the outputs. So what happens if instead of having like two classes, um, we have more more classes, so uh, as outputs, right? So here the the output actually it's a should it's a one D in the, in the sense that it's zero or one, so it can be class zero or class one. But what if you have more than this, more more outputs than all it's zero or one? What if I want to solve, for example, a problem in which I have these uh, images of handwritten digits? And there are like 10 different digits. So there are like 10 classes. So in this case, the, the dimensionality of the output, it's 10. Um, how can I uh, represent these 10 different classes? Because now it's not enough with zero or, or one, okay? Now we have 10 different classes. And uh, even if they are numbers, they, in terms of, of classification, they have nothing to do. So uh, in terms of, of visual recognition, digit number two is as similar to digit number three than to digit number nine, okay? So they are totally independent classes. There's no, uh, it's not that one class is closer to another. So what do we do in these cases? Um, typically, and that's what we're going to be using in this, in this course, what we are going to do is encode these n-dimensional outputs with uh, what we call a one-hot vector. So that's uh, a very simple codification in, in which you will have a vector as, as large as the amount of different classes that you want to classify with. You have all the elements of the vector set to zero in, except one of them that corresponds to the class that you want to represent. So for example, in this figure, what you see is that it's, it's encoding the positions in a three-dimensional space 
of a class motorbike, uh, bicycle, and jock. And it's assigning different encodings, depending on the position of the one, into this three, uh, three dimensional vector. Yeah, this one hot representations will allow us to work uh, with as many uh, output classes as we want when we are trying, when we are going to solve classification problems. Cool. Um, just to finish this model, I have a few questions for you. Um, the first one is, what is the dimensionality of a one hot representation of the MNIST classes? So I didn't mention it, but these MNIST classes are the ones from the digits that I show earlier, okay? So remember that now what you need to do is to think about the dimension of the output. So this will be the, the solution, Chen, right? Because there are like Chen different digits. So the output of the one hot representation should have a dimension Chen. Another question. How, so should you treat these three problems as a classification or as regression problems? First problem, predicting whether stock price of a company will increase tomorrow. So is that a regression or classification? Second, predict the number of copies a music album will be sold next month. Regression or classification problem. Or predicting the gender of a person by his, her handwriting style. So let's look at the answer and discuss. So in this case, if you want to predict whether the stock price of a company will increase tomorrow, this is a binary classification task. So whether it increase or it doesn't, right? So it's a classification task. There's, there's no, it's not, I'm not asking about uh, a rate, like how much, and just trying, I'm asking about if it increases or not, just a, just, just a trend. If I had asked for, a, for the ratio, a growth rate, that would have been a regression problem. But the second one, predict the number of copies of music album will be sold next month. So this is a number, so it's a regression um, problem. Um, I mean, even if maybe it doesn't provide an integer, you can always round it up to, uh, to the closer integer. So no problem with that. It's a regression problem. And the last one, predicting if a gender of a person by his or her handwriting style. Um, so it's going to be a classification problem between all the genders that you consider. Cool, just to finish, uh, there's this discussion if you wanna think about it, as you have the slides, you can click on, on the link and, and see the, the this. But basically what I uh, mentioned earlier is that actually when you do supervised learning, actually in general, when you train a deep, uh, machine learning algorithm, you are somehow doing some cure fitting and then this tweet says, okay, whenever I see this kind of headline, and this headline says, AI today and tomorrow is mostly about cure feeding, not intelligence. So the Mike Condorcet says, I was thinking, what if intelligence is mostly about cure feeding and we are merely too unself aware to notice? So the, the, the underlying question is like, is intelligence some, some kind of cure feeding? Because basically we are seeing that uh, all these evolutions with the current tools which are doing cool, cool feeding. So is that maybe intelligence? I think it's an interesting question you can think about. And as I mentioned, you can click on the on the tweet and see the, the thread for discussion. So that it for this session. Uh, so I'll stop the recording and hopefully get into the question stuff. Thank you.